Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is my New York. Scrabble Corner, Featherbed Lane, Glass Bottle Beach, evocative names, all of them places in our city. Names of New York is a fascinating look at how the names of New York streets and neighborhoods and buildings shape the identity of the city. Its author is geographer Joshua Jelly Shapiro. He's here to take us on an engaging tour of the city next. Joshua Jelly Shapiro, it is a delight to welcome you to the program. I'm glad you're here. Thanks for having me. Pleased to be here. And I want to tell the audience that besides writing delightful books like Names of New York, uh, Joshua is a geographer, of course, and uh, scholar in residence and teacher at the uh, New York Inst uh, NYU's Institute for, for Public Knowledge. I was thinking about Juliet, Shakespeare's Juliet, who tried to argue uh, that names were arbitrary, you know, arose by any other name. Um, not successful, as it turned out for her. But for you, uh, the first two words of your book, names matter. You, you have a whole different point of view, and especially about place names, which, as you point out, contain wonderful stories. And there are plenty in this book. Yeah, indeed. Another sentence in the book, of course, is uh, in place names lie stories. And I think that one of the sort of core ideas of this book, of course, is just to sort of peel back and dig into all the stories that a place name can contain. Uh, a place name like New York or a place name like Brooklyn or a place name like Broadway or the Bowery or even the numbered streets in New York, of course, contain innumerable stories and associations and meanings that people project onto them. Uh, and yes, to, to invoke that phrase you invoke, names matter. For me, I think names, names do matter. I think they matter to all of us. You know, those of us who, if you've ever had a kid and struggled over what to give that kid for a name or uh, had the experience of having your own name evoke certain things for people that you know, uh, you know, names, names matter. Your uh, passion for New York's place names throughout the book is palpable, which uh, I commend from, uh, for a kid from Vermont. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. I, I grew up on the mean streets of Vermont. That's true. In the Green Mountain. <laughs> uh, but I have, uh, I have family roots in the city, as you know, many Americans do, family roots that reach the yeah. island. And uh, I've always spent time in the city and you know, now spent much of my adult life here. Um, but yes, it's true. I, I grew up far from the city, but projecting ideas onto it and, and desiring it and wanting to live there one day. Now, now I do, of course. Yeah. Let's start with some of the stories that come down from names from our original settlers, the people who were here first, the Lenape uh, Indians, and so many place names in, in the city and, and in the area, the metropolitan area, are still names from their language. Absolutely, yes. So the, the Lenape people who spoke a, an Algonquian uh, language called Munsee uh, were the people who were here, of course, when Henry Hudson and his crew of sailors, you know, turned into the upper bay and, and turned up the Hud what became the Hudson River. Uh, and of course, the most famous uh, Lenape Munsee word that we have is Manhattan, which is derived from sure. this word Manahatta that one of Hudson's sailors put down on his log and said the people here seem to call this island Manahatta. There's a lot of disagreement about what exactly uh, the person that that sailor overheard uh, uh, meant by that. Um, our best guess now is perhaps that they heard Manahaton, which uh, in Munsee means place where we gathered wood for bows and arrows. Um, mm. Many, many names, of course, you know, you think across the river, Hackensack and Hoboken and Passaic and in Brooklyn, we have Canarsie, we have Rockaway out in, out in Queens, uh, Maspeth, which means bad water in the language of the Lenape. Wow. It's sort of amusing if you know Newtown Creek. So right yeah. there and that um, Creek, yeah. Yeah, but in any case, there are, yes, any number of uh, Native American place names that um, come from either descriptive words like that one bad water or uh, sometimes from 
you know, named for native leaders. Goannis is one of those. Um, yeah, Tammany, uh, I think I learned from your book was, yes. I, I, I'm a New Yorker and I'm embarrassed to say that I don't think I knew that Tammany, who has a hall, <laughs> uh, yeah. was an Indian uh, a Lenape chief or a leader. Indeed, yes, he was a, 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 a sort of illustrious uh, leader of the tribe actually over in Pennsylvania. Um, so not even in sort of greater New York, but he was a, a Lenape leader of, of some note and Tammany Hall took their name, uh, you know, that uh, notorious political organization, right, in New yeah. York's history, took their name from uh, this native leader. And it's interesting that because there's a dynamic, I think, in, in native place names often that uh, Americans or sort of white Americans or, or people who are not Native American have had this attachment to Native American names for a very long time. They like that they evoke a certain sense of the landscape or of, uh, of whatever else, all these kind of virtues. And, and people, Walt Whitman said, you know, I was looking for quote, savage and luxuriant syllables and behold the Native American names, they all fit. And he said, yeah. Mississippi, it rolls a shoe a thousand miles long. So we've always loved the sound of those names, but sometimes there's a, a you know, a troubling way in which the attachment to those names uh, existed alongside pushing people off the land, of course. But, well, as you say in the book, quite uh, wryly, I suppose, uh, what's more American than naming stuff for people you've killed? And uh, right. yeah, exactly. I mean, we killed them off. And yeah. I think I also saw in your book that um, between the time that the Dutch first arrived here mm. and the American Revolution, 90% uh, of the native, you know, the Lenape and others were extinguished or, or sent away. Yes, indeed. Yeah, no, and that, of course, happened all across the Americas and largely, obviously, because of, you know, conflict and war, but, but even more so just because of disease, you know, that Native Americans hadn't been exposed to all these nasty germs that Europeans uh, had because they had been around these farm animals for, for a long time. Um, in any case, that's a sort of a whole other story. But yes, uh, the decimation of Native peoples is, is at the core of our history, you know, American history and New York history. But there are these sort of wonderful uh, remnants or memories, of course, of those people and those cultures and those place names are, are one of them. And one of the joys of this book, I had the opportunity to, to take some Lenape uh, Muncie language classes. Uh, mm. from a woman yeah, it's, who, it's important to, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because I think it's important to tell folks that the Lenape culture is is still uh, alive here and, and uh, flourishing to some extent that the classes you took, uh, let's talk more about that. There are powwows every year. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. No, people, you know, people don't think of, of New York City as a as a hotbed or a center of Native American culture. But, you know, according to the census, over 100,000 people in, in New York of Native American ancestry, which makes it, you know, the largest populace actually of indigenous uh, American people in the country, which you don't mm. think of. But yes, there are many people here uh, from many different tribes and groups. And the Lenape, most of their descendants um, now live in either Oklahoma or in Ontario, um, on reservations in, in those places. But uh, there is a wonderful kind of revival and energy around nurturing the language that they spoke. And there's a the Nape Center in Manhattan now. Um, is that where you took the classes? I, I took the class actually at uh, the Endangered Language Alliance, which is a, a wonderful nonprofit that works with speakers of all kinds of small languages in the city. Uh, small, by which I mean without many speakers. Um, you have something like, they estimate 800 languages spoken in New York now, perhaps many more, um, which is an astonishing thing about this city. You know, it makes it the most linguistically diverse place in the, in the world. Um, yeah. And in the history of the world, in fact, as they say. So one of the things I was interested in this book is just to think about all the languages that people craft names and, and sort of create attachments to place in. Um, and one of them, of course, is Lenape, the Munsee, and they have this woman come down, Karen Hunter from Ontario. She drives 12 hours to teach these Muncie language classes. And it was quite a magical thing to hear, you know, the language that was first spoken here, 
hear it spoken again and, and, and learn some words. And so it was a wonderful I'd love to hear it. Can you, and I hate to put you on the spot, but can you say something in Lenape? Yes, here's here's one little one little phrase, Stanley. Ni nun yi yayi lenape hoking, which hmm. means in my poor accent, I live in the Lenape homeland. Yes. As we all do. So there you go. Ni nun yi yayi lenape hoking. Well, this is the Lenape homeland, and uh, and I'm a, and I'm I'm happy that uh, you're recognizing it and giving me a chance to recognize it. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. Uh, let's get to some of those stories. Maybe we'll jump around the boroughs yeah. a little bit. Uh, I'm from the Bronx, um, mm -hmm. and so I uh, I really alighted on Featherbed Lane. I, <laughs> I love that. Uh, I don't know where that is, but I in the Bronx. But I, I love the images it conveys. Absolutely, yeah, Featherbed Lane. I mean, some of these antiquated names have stuck around in our maps. There's all kinds of colorful ones in the past, but Featherbed Lane. As the story goes, it's still on the map in the Bronx, sort of in the, in the center, just north of Marseille, I believe. Essentially takes its name from, in the days when the uh, Croton Aqueduct was getting built, the workmen uh, on, the, on the aqueduct frequented some bordellos that were in that area. Uh -huh. And, and okay. so the name Featherbed Lane, as the story goes, comes from uh, all these uh, dens of iniquity that were, were there uh, along where the Croton Aqueduct was getting built. I may have a Bronx story for you, Joshua. I grew up in, in uh, Riverdale, about five blocks from, from Yonkers. So I'm hardly, I just made it under, <laughs> under yeah. the line here. Um, uh, and there is, a, there is in, in the Bronx a, a, an apartment complex called Skyview. Yes. And of course, that's a real estate developer's name or whatever. Uh, I wonder if the developer or whoever gave it that name would be interested in the fact that a boy who grew up in Skyview apartments and who liked to take his telescope up to the roof and look at the stars grew up to be Neil deGrasse Tyson. Right. Excellent. How wonderful. Yeah. And I mean, this, it's a great anecdote. And I think it speaks to the ways in which sometimes a place name kind of becomes a part of the place or it kind of yeah, um, in some uh, mysterious and wonderful way, it kind of shapes the identity of that place, and that's a wonderful anecdote that perhaps subconsciously Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, growing up in a place called Skyview, he thought to look toward the heavens. Um, perhaps who knows? But that's a great story. Yeah, I, I give credit to Arlene Alda. She wrote a book called uh, "Just Kids from the Bronx," right? And that's where I got the that's where I got the anecdote. He wasn't treated terribly well. He got arrested for you know so a couple of times because neighbors would call you know he's black and there weren't many people who looked like him in Riverdale and uh, when the when the police came he was able to actually charm them and say I'm not doing anything wrong look through this telescope and then they they did and according to the story in Arlene's book and, yes. and they left him alone after that and I'm, I'm glad they did. <laughs> I wonder why you know it's funny I have a kid's book written by Neil deGrasse Tyson that I read to my toddler and it has that anecdote in it about he's on the roof with the telescope and the police the neighbors what's this guy doing and say up there with mysterious equipment and oh looking at the stars so it's all okay yeah let's uh let's jump over to queens where there is a very interesting sign on a corner in uh, jackson heights and you can give us the derivation of this street name yes uh the the famous scrabble corner there uh -huh. is, is as you can see in the the image you know, it has the subscript numbers like on, on Scrabble tiles telling you the worth of each of the letters there in, in 35th Avenue. Um, and the story of that is essentially at that intersection um, uh, in Jackson Heights, in the basement of, of the Methodist Church, uh, is where Scrabble was invented by an architect called Alfred uh, Butts. He, uh, during the Depression, he was there, I guess, trying to pass the time with his neighbors and came up with this word game he called crisscross words and went on to become immensely popular and beloved still to this day. And the story of the street sign is quite wonderful because essentially just someone, a resident who we don't know who it was, put up a street sign like this and kind of very subtle nod to where the game was invented mm -hmm. Yeah, 20 years ago or so. And 
it became a kind of beloved and subtle neighborhood landmark, but it wasn't official. And eventually the DOT got, got around to taking the unofficial sign down, but it becomes so beloved that uh, the city council person in that part of Queens, Danny Drum, when he was first elected uh, about 10 years ago, I believe, he made it a cause to say, no, I'm gonna convince the city to make this a, an official honorary street name. And so now it, it's there, the famous Scrabble Corner. And it's a, it's a wonderful comment. I think I, I spoke earlier about all the languages that are spoken in New York. And of course, Jackson Heights now is, is the center of that. You know, there are more languages spoken in that part of Queens than anywhere in the city. People from all over the world, South Asia and Africa and, and Latin America. And it's wonderful, the Methodist church where uh, Mr. Butts invented Scrabble, you know, they give services in, in a dozen languages or something. It's a, it's a wonderful, you know, melting pot and microcosm of New York. Your book also celebrates uh, the waves of immigrants who have come to the city and make it the city it is. Um, Astoria, I have a daughter living in Astoria and she would be charmed uh, by the story of that name. Astoria, yes, it takes its name, as you could perhaps guess, from uh, the illustrious Astor family, from John Jacob Astor in particular, the patriarch of that family that he first made his fortune in furs and then bought up, you know, huge swaths of city real estate and the, made the family's fortune. And the story of Astoria is essentially in the 1840s, uh, when Queens was still quite rural, you know, there were villages across what was then Queens County. And the people who founded this new village right by the East River, uh, in their charter, they decided to call it Astoria because they were hoping that the old man would give them money, would sort of mm. big roll the place. And, and they could literally see a his naming, a naming deal. What's that? A naming deal. They're trying to. Exactly, right. Like stadiums now or something. Right. But the catch was, you know, they could see his mansion across the river and they said, we're going to build this place and honor you. and. He, in fact, never set foot there. Um, he wasn't much interested in the place. And he sent $500 and, you know, and called it a day, which, you know, in the 1840s was a decent sum, but it wasn't, you know, millions of dollars. Um, in Brooklyn, there's a place called Glass Bottle Beach, which I have actually visited, and uh, I'm still trying to wash the, <laughs> the, the stench out of my clothing. Uh, why don't you tell us just a little bit about that? Yeah, Glass Bottle Beach, it's um, it's on a place called, well, Dead Horse Bay, so another evocative name, and it's on what was once Barren Island, which is now not an island because it's connected uh, to Brooklyn down there by Canarsie, and Barren Island was this place that uh, originally named for, by the Dutch, Barren Island, Island of Bears became Barren Islands, the English. Mm -hmm. It was essentially a garbage dump and a place where the city in the 19th century, you know, sent all the, all the horses when they'd expired and gotten tired of, you know, pulling things around Manhattan. That's where they went to get processed and turned into glue. In any case, the reason for Glass Bottle Beach is that it did become, as I say, a kind of, a kind of garbage dump. And even in the days of Robert Moses, some, some decades after the end of the horse rendering, uh, it was where, you know, all these, all these bottles, all this trash were sort of uh, used to create fill, to enlarge the island, to connect it to Brooklyn. But now what you have is, because it wasn't sort of layered properly, is that along the edge of Dead Horse Bay there, there's all this, all these pieces of glass, all this, all this sort of old trash, and not just glass, but yeah. it's called Glass Bottle Beach because as the tide goes in and out, you see all this, this sort of tinkling of the glass and all the, all the remnants of these old aspirin bottles and beer bottles and everything. So it's a uh, Urban archaeologists love the place, but as you say, it's, um, you know, if you're not into garbage dumps, it may not be your cup of tea. <laughs> you pointed out earlier just the iconic name. I mean, we know Brooklyn and we can do the derivation of that from the Dutch, but Brooklyn has become a, a, a phenomenon. I mean, the word, the name, you know, you can go to probably, uh, I don't know, Nigeria and find a Brooklyn t-shirt or something. Absolutely. But it's amazing because Brooklyn once, not unlike the Bronx, you know, it was sort of, it was the outskirts of the city. It was where immigrants came to settle, you know, very much working class. And now, of course, it has this cachet as, you know, a place of location of, of hip culture and music and art and all these things. And I think people from around the world now associate 
Brooklyn with these things. And but I will say I I blame uh, you know Victoria and David Beckham for naming one of their kids oh, okay. for the uh, <laughs> for the trend of you know Brooklyn is now every year is is one of the you know few most dozen popular uh, names for given names for baby girls in the U.S. So yeah. it's amazing how these names can kind of take on lives of their own. Uh, Your book points out a disturbing well a lot of disturbing things, um, but one of them involves women and the fact that place names for women in this city are shamefully lacking. Um, uh, you did a you did an atlas with with Rebecca Solnit called Nonstop Metropolis, and uh, maps. And in yeah. one of the maps in that book was you guys, you and she took the subway map and renamed all the subway stops for women. But let's talk a little bit about the the lack of names for women place names. Yeah, absolutely. No, and that that map that you mentioned, Rebecca Solnit, my collaborator, she. As she put it, you know, New York, like most every city in the world, really, is, as she puts it, is a manscape in the sense that 95% yeah. of everything you know, is named for men. I and mean, this is just the way it's been historically, and that's slowly changing. But one of the points of that map, and I write about this in the new book, is that, you know, essentially just to get us to think about how our perception of the city might change if we had a map of place names that, that honored the contributions of women to this place. And of course, those have been legion and reach back all throughout New York's history. Um, and so we did that by renaming uh, stops on the subway. But you could also talk, for example, about statues and monuments. And, uh, you know, up until a few years ago, we had something like, I think it's 195 statues across New York of, of real life historical men, you know, politicians and doctors mm -hmm. and all the rest. And um, just three women, four women, uh, not including the uh, imaginary ones. You know, we have Ms. Liberty in the harbor and Alice in Wonderland in Central Park. To underline your point, until I think last year, very recently, not one statue in Central Park was of a, of a woman, a real, you know, other, other than a somebody out of a fable. And now there's the, the one with Sojourner Truth and the other two, but you yep. yeah, right. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth K. Stanton, exactly. So now we finally, there's three women in Central Park. It took a long time. I guess we could talk about how names reveal uh, who's really a New Yorker and who isn't. Because <laughs> when somebody in, uh, 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 you know, encounters the street downtown that looks like it's a name for a, a city in Texas, Houston, and says Houston, then we know that that person is not from around here. Yeah, exactly. So as as a New York as New Yorkers know, that's Houston Street. Um, and of course, the reason for that is the, the man who Houston Street was named for predates Sam Houston of, of Texas fame uh, by a decade or two. He's a sort of uh, politician in early New York, sort of not long after the the revolution. Um, and there is this funny thing, I think. The way in which people just pronounce names can signal their ties to the place or even what names they use. I also talk in the book how, you know, if someone ever asks you where the where the Robert F. Kennedy Bridge is, you know, <laughs> this is something New Yorkers, it's on the map as that, but we know it as the Triborough. The Triborough exactly. Bridge will always be the Triborough Bridge. And yeah. There's a funny way in which sometimes these names, if people don't take to them, you know, then they, they don't stick in our minds and they also uh, can signal those who know or inhabit the city and those who don't. Yeah, you, well, your, your story about that in the book reminded me or made me think of uh, the 59th Street Bridge. Yeah. That's the 59th Street Bridge. It's not the Ed Koch Bridge. Exactly. It'll never be the Ed Koch Bridge. Exactly. And, and, the, and the newest one uh, up the river, you know, the Tappan Zee Bridge. Absolutely. And it's now the Mario Cuomo uh, exactly. bridge. But no, it's, I loved Mario Cuomo. Um, yeah. I spent quite a number of years covering him. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, that's the Tappan Zee Bridge. I'm yeah, sorry. Like Tappan Zee. And Tappan Zee is a, you know, that's a good place name too. It, it's a sort of uh, mashup of the, of the Lenape and the Dutch. It was the Tappan were the band of the Lenape who were in that part of Westchester. And Z is the old Dutch word for sea. And of course, that's where uh -huh. the Hudson gets really wide, like a lake. So the Tappan Z is the Tappan Sea. So it's a wonderful yes. 
old mix of, of Dutch and, and Lenape from colonial days. Uh, but yes, anyway, any any number of names you can sort of riff on like this. Um, there is Wu. I, I, we should mention because we're running out of time here. There, there is uh, the Wu Tang district in Staten Island. Uh, mm -hmm. We should we should mm -hmm. give them a shout out. Absolutely, um, I'm, I'm glad you did so. Of course, that's one of the. Now we're up to near 1,800 honorary or, or second names across the city. Uh, since the 90s, when it became easier for city council to add these names, we've had a, a huge flourishing, and many of them are, are quite wonderful. The Wu-Tang District is one of my favorites, for sure. We can Perhaps we can end this uh, with a, a duel, you and me, yeah. uh, a brick bat against real estate agents. There are just too many damn places that real estate agents have named. No Leap yeah. and Nomad and Fidei. And uh, you know what, folks? Keep them. I don't want those. How okay. about you? I'm over though. We need to ban those those acronym, you know, shorthand things. It started with Soho and Tribeca, which neighborhood residents coined back in the 70s, and it became these real estate things. But yes, all the other new ones, Bokaka in in, in really Bokaka. That That's Borough Hill, Carroll Gardens, and 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 Cobble Hill. You know, it's a kind of <laughs> brownstone Brooklyn, but they're trying to sell it as a as a commodity, Bokaka, terrible. They tried to rebrand the South Bronx as Sobro, which absolutely <laughs> not, you know. Oh, absolutely not. Joshua Jelly Shapiro, it is so delightful to talk with you. This book, Names of New York, is so delightful. I thank you for the time. Thank you so much. Really a pleasure.